indeterminacy of archives, their murkiness, their multivalence, which has helped to produce today's fabulously interesting conference session. So before we begin, we'd like to thank our organizers, Anna, Wada, and Francesca, for organizing this session, and our co-presenters for more than fulfilling the promise of the session's topic. Like many of you, we've benefited from the ambiguity of archives, particularly their occupation of a conceptual crossroads that will be exceedingly familiar to all of you between words and things. In the following presentation, we will consider a few ways in which the in-betweenness of archives has shaped the work that we, as historians of archaeology, do. Our presentation will unfold as follows. First, we will briefly discuss the conceptual space occupied by archives in archaeological and other thought. Our aim in this first section of our presentation will be to foreground the materiality of archives. In the second section of our presentation, we will offer some thoughts as to what the materiality of archives uh, has meant for our research. Um, Anne is going to talk about the Nicoria Archive at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. Um, and I'm going to, I Thea, will be talking about the personal archive of Antonin Salaj at the Academy of Science of the Czech Republic. Finally, we're going to close by discussing some of the ways in which archives destabilize boundaries between history and archaeology. So uh, let's begin now with a broad strokes account of our ideas about archives, particularly as we've already indicated with respect to their materiality. Uh, you've already heard a few papers about archives, but it still makes sense for us to begin with a loose definition. Um, so we'll start with the definition provided by the American Society of Archivists in 2007's What is an Archives? And yes, I found out that archives is actually a singular word, not a plural. Even though it looks like a plural. Anyway, um, an archives is a place where people go to find information. But rather than gathering information from books as you would in a library, people who do research in archives often gather first-hand facts from letters, uh, whoops, what am I right? Yeah, facts, data, and evidence from letters, reports, notes, memos, photographs, audio, and video recordings, and other primary sources. Um, archival materials are not random. They've been intentionally grouped together. Uh, they share or they've been identified as sharing a characteristic, a commonality that accounts for their being grouped together. Um, so the preceding is a fairly uncontroversial definition. Um, in it, we see much of what Derrida in Archive Fever identifies as definitive of archives. Most basically, um, in this and in Derrida, um, archives gather like materials in a particular place. Um, and since this is Derrida, and this is Derrida pondering archives by a Freud, um, archives are also sites of conflict, authority, the <coughs> drive, the future. Um, what we really like to draw out from archive fever is pretty simple. Um, just the idea of the archive as a material object. Um, the archive's materiality, the way in which the archive material or materially manifests itself, um, is not incidental to the information it contains. Um, it's part and parcel of that information. Um, so archive fever dates to the mid-1990s, so naturally Demida is contemplating the effect of computers on archivization in general, um, and psychoanalytic archives in particular. Um, how would psychoanalysis look if Freud had a computer? Um, no need for you guys to ponder the effect the computer might have had on Flinders Petrie's work. Um, we just want you to keep in mind, words and things are entangled. So we draw a lot of our inspiration from new materialist archaeological scholarship, um, much of which defends the status of things versus words, and sometimes with reference to archives. Um, the exigencies of time are preventing us from extensive elaboration of this topic, so we just tossed up a few quotes from some of these works now just to justify our emphasis on the materiality of archives um, to those of you who are not inclined to trust very bad. Um, so observe. Of course, I'm going to give you a second to read them. Okay. Now, on to our case studies. What happens when, as a consequence of their materiality, we consider archives archaeological? Okay, so this section focuses on uh, my own research of the archive of the Nicoria excavations. Um, the site of Nicoria is located. Oops, 
sorry, uh, where the Red Circle is in the Peloponnese of Greece. Um, it was excavated from 1969 to 73, and then it had study seasons uh, on site in 74 and 75. Um, and it was excavated by an American team under the direction of William McDonald. Um, among other reasons, and I'm happy to discuss these in a question and answer session, uh, the core is significant because of the role the site played in the discourse surrounding the end of the Bronze Age and so called Dark Ages or Early Iron Age in Greece, which is the subject of my own research. The portion of the Nicoria Excavation Archive I've been working with is located at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, um, or after all, I'll just say ASCSA. Um, I say portion because it's actually an incomplete archive, something I just learned this summer. Um, some materials related to the excavation, unclear exactly what and how much is actually um, elsewhere, and the archivist has her suspicions, but it's also a topic for discussion. Um, the materials that are there arrived as part of a larger initiative at the beginning of the 1980s to centralize the archives with not only ASC-led projects, but also affiliated projects, um, and materials were sent in voluntarily. And so now that ASC is saying no collects the archives of affiliated projects unless it is known the materials in question are in clear danger of damage or loss. Um, for more information, you can read the, what they say on their website about collection policies. Okay, so the materials from the Nicoria Archive are stored in incredible boxes and are accompanied by a finding aid, um, which details what is in each number box. So, for example, end of season reports, 71 to 72. Um, and these are some pictures of the no quarter boxes in particular, and kind of just a view of a hallway of boxes mm -hmm. in the American school. Um, when archives are accessions to the ASCSA, they are kept as close as possible to the organization they were received in. So this is significant because it means one may be able to infer at least a little bit about at least one stage of organization by whoever was managing the archive before its arrival at the American school. Uh, the Nicoya archive is assembled by type um, that is, photographs are together, and their season reports together, so and so on. Um, and also in roughly chronological order by season. So despite not being complete, the Nicoya archive is a fairly extensive representation of the documentation of the excavation and study seasons. It includes photographs, fine parts, notebooks, end of season reports, inventories, plans, and the like. I am only in the preliminary stages of my examination of this archive, but in the next few minutes, I'll provide a few thoughts about how I've begun to think about the issues of physicality and temporality um, in working in this archive. So as I mentioned earlier, this discovery of the um, Dark Age remains at Nicoria played a key role in the evolving narrative of the Greek Dark Ages and Early Iron Age. So the knowledge production surrounding this, um, the excavation of these is, is of interest to me. Consequently, I've started to trace how a particular building dating to the Dark Ages is referred to during the excavation. Um, specifically, there seems to be an interchange change between calling it an outsider building and a temple um, within the journals and end of season reports. Uh, so an event relating to the on-site discourse of this building, for example, the director takes a photograph and discusses it with the trench supervisor, um, prompting him to record some thoughts in his diary, it may have happened in a matter of minutes in the field. However, given the archive is organized by type, as I just mentioned, it would take me considerably longer to reassemble the traces of this process of knowledge production. I'd have to go through each relevant rock separately to access that information. Um, which, given actually the policy, is about a number of boxes out of the time I couldn't really even do in the archive. Um, so instead, I have to conduct my own kind of post excavation analysis through the pertinent materials using ind other indicators such as dates and labels um, where they are available. In other ways, however, the reverse can be true. That is, a material feature of the archive that increases the temporal scale of my own excavation. Um, indicates a corresponding shift in scale within the original field process. Um, so the quick example of this is that when I opened the box of the first round of the 1972 field notebooks, I encountered a slight surprise. Instead of the hard background notebooks previously used during the 69 to 71 seasons, the notebooks were now a stack of loose leaf notes, log forms, and drawings encased within a folded piece of cardstock. 
Apparently, in 1972, the excavation shifted to a loose leaf recording system for reasons still unknown to me, but I'm going to look into. Um, as I begin my own system of recording, I noticed that there seemed to be an increase in the number of pages for which I had to go through my process. Um, my page comes confirmed this. Several of the trench supervisors were recording significantly more in volume than in the bound notebooks. For example, during the 1971 season, William Coulson wrote about 150 pages in his notebook. Um, but in 1972, the pages numbered almost 300, which is twice as much. Um, and I'm unclear if this was a conscious um, thing or not, but um, this change in recording is something I plan to pursue further. And now we'll move on to our next case study. So Andalou Salah was a prominent epigrapher, archaeologist, and philologist based in Prague at the Czech University, uh, today's Charles University, and at the Academy of Science during the first half of the 20th century. So uh, this is Salah, and these are his dates. Um, this past June, I finished my dissertation, basically a biography on Salah, using about a dozen archives in France, Greece, and the Czech Republic. The most useful of these archives, the archive with which I worked most extensively, was Salah's personal archive um, in, at the Academy of Science of the Czech Republic. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to walk you through just a few examples of ways in which my determination to approach my archival research materially or archaeologically contributed to my project. So um, a constitutive component of the archive, of the archive is as material, is its location in a particular place. Uh, the location of Salaj's personal archive at the Academy of Science, or the location of the archives housing his archive at the Academy of Science, merits mention, actually, because it's a place imbued with a great deal of presence, of uh, that ineffable, effective quality that pervades the material. Um, so Salaj's materials are kept in a building on the outskirts of Prague on a street called Gavchikova, not far from this monument. Um, and this monument commemorates the assassination of the Nazi rights protector, uh, Reinhard Heydrich, um, this is uh, Heydrich Mazatov, uh, this like, sharp turn where Heydrich was assassinated. This is during Salish's lifetime and was pretty significant for his life. Um, so when it was Heydrich's assassination that precipitated the notorious raising of the village of Levice, as well as the subsequent and much less well-known raising of the village of Lejaki. And I'll return to this later. Just briefly. Briefly. 15 minutes. Um, so Salish's personal archive at the Academy of Science is vast and unprocessed. Uh, vast means that it comprises several dozen archival boxes, just some not beautiful pictures of boxes. Um, and unprocessed means that it's not been organized or cleaned up, though other scholars have looked through it since its accession to the archive. Um, that Salaj's archive is unprocessed is an important historiographical fact. It tells us that though the archive was created after Salaj's death for the future, the future is not really Salaj's. I'm the first person to have produced a monograph-length study of Salaj, though I recently learned that someone at the pedagogical faculty of Charles University began, but did not complete this project. Um, so because it's unprocessed, Salaj's archive bears marks of material decay, rusting paper clips, crumbling acidic paper, as well as vestiges of his personal organizational system. Um, for, according to his former colleague, uh, Pavel Skunar, um, Salaj's Academy of Science archives comprise uh, paper textual materials that were just gathered from Salaj, a bachelor's apartment, by his students and colleagues after his death. Um, and presumably because of some sort of unconscious archaeological impulse, um, I am an excavating archaeologist too. Um, I conducted my archival research with obsessive concern for context, photographing the bulk of his archive in order, including folders and archival boxes, which is why I have beautiful photos like this one, um, and keeping those photographs in order. And this was useful because it helped me date and attribute undated and unattributed material based on his association with other materials, um, and this is all pretty basic, sort of a stratigraphic you know, analysis of the archive. Um, but approaching Salaj's archive in this way also showed me his personal archival practices, um, you know, some of his impulses toward memorialization. And Salaj himself organized and alphabetized some of his correspondence, perhaps in uh, response to the establishment of the Academy's archive near the end of his life. Um, so I've already mentioned the evocative location of uh, the Academy's archives, um, and I want to close with a profoundly affecting set of materials, and they're made even more effective by Salish's determination to group them together. Um, so this, and whoops, I went backward. Oh my gosh. It's this one. Okay. Um, uh, 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 this folder um, is labeled the Yitzhak, um, and it contains within it the, it's just a folder piece of paper, actually. 
um, the front pages of eight different newspapers, each of which gives an account of the Czechoslovak president Edvard Beneš's post-war speech at Ligice, uh, which is one of many in which he blamed the whole German nation, selling Yemetsky Narod, for the massacre at Ligice. Um, and it was in part, so I think these were just a couple of newspapers, it was in part as a result of these speeches that the demography of the Czechoslovak state changed dramatically. Um, thousands of Germans, including many of Salaj's colleagues, fled and were deported from Czechoslovakia more or less violently in the post-war years. Um, we can't say why, but we do know, because of this organization, that Salaj gathered together eight different front pages that are like this. Um, From the preceding presentation, we've gestured towards some of the ways in which the materiality of archives, the archaeology of archives, has shaped our work. Um, so in conclusion, we'd just like to remind you of another broader way in which the archaeology of archives contributes to our scholarship, namely in collapsing the dichotomy between what Laurent Olivier calls historicist and archaeological time. Olivier derives this aforementioned dichotomy between the source's time, time is ordered sequential with history um, of the past, and archaeological, time is memory, duration, history as containing the present, as being articulated from the present. Um, from Walter Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of, of history. Um, this is the key quote from Benjamin. To articulate the past historically does not mean to recognize it as the way it really was. It means to seize hold of a memory as it flashes up in a moment of danger. The archive is traditionally, and of course, simplistically regarded as a historical object, not an archaeological object. It is the creative historicist histories of ordered sequential time in the past. In fact, thanks to its materiality, the archive stands somewhere between history and archaeology, somewhere between historicism and archaeological time. As material, it persists, it has duration, it changes. Um, recall the crumbling papers from the Slash archive. Historicist histories can be written from archives, but in fact, the archive is also a thing of the present, a profoundly archaeological object. We believe in the archaeology of the archive. <laughs>